Welcome everyone. My name is Ross, Ross Clark, the Mindful Coach. I'm really glad to be with you today. I'd like to share some of the aspects of mindfulness. Uh, give us a little bit of a, a basis of what mindfulness is and then how we can apply that to mindfulness at work. So the topic for today is mindfulness at work connection. Uh, this is a little bit of information about myself. I am a certified mindfulness-based stress reduction trainer, uh, certified mindfulness-based eating awareness trainer, certified mindfulness-based cognitive therapist, cognitive therapy trainer, <laughs> uh, certified uh, master life coach, uh, and also certified chronic disease self-management trainer, uh, and uh, Mindful Movement for Clinicians and, and an Asian trained Vipassana and uh, Jhana meditation teacher and a professional speaker. Uh, some of the clients are York University, City of Waterloo, University of Waterloo, uh, private consulting practice, Inland Revenue, uh, New, York, or New Zealand, uh, Department of National Defense, St. Joseph's Hospital, Guelph, Ontario, uh, healthcare professionals, New Zealand, um, mindfulness con consultants, mindfulness consultant for University of Florida, uh, complementary healing arts clinic, and the Rotman School of Management, University of Toronto. And so today, this is the content that we will be covering. We're going to be covering the Connection topics, the subtopics of teamwork, reliable, or uh, the ripple effect, the realm of email, and skillful self-expression. Now, we're also going to use practice. Practices are going to be important. So we're going to practice active grounding, passive grounding, a little bit of mindful listening, and some deep listening, just to fill out the... Um, the period, the lunch and learn period. So the learning objectives uh, for today are and guidelines. Um, this is educational and content, so it's not to take the place of any professional form of therapy or or anything of of that nature. And it is everything is optional. So if something doesn't feel like right, just set it aside. And generalizations are used at time just to save time and um, to make things a little bit simpler. So in the workshop or in this Lunch and Learn, we're going to be looking at doing some exercises. So if I just stand and talk, um, we can see that what we'll retain will be maybe about five or eight percent. Um, if we practice these practices that are being offered here today, we may have a retention rate of around 80%. So we will be doing some practices, and again, they're just going to be optional. So mindfulness. The three distinctions for mindfulness, attention, intention, reflection. So this would be a mindfulness triangle. We have attention, so we could use the attention as uh, we feel cool, so we can feel that our body is cool, our attention is drawn to feeling the body. Then we could have an intention. Mm. So the intention could be, I'm going to put on a sweater now. And then we could reflect on, now I wonder why I'm feeling cold. Is it the room or is there something else that's happening? So that's the reflective part. This part here is dominant. We use this a lot. And if we were not using mindfulness, what we would find is that the attention here tends to be oh, not, uh, not as clear, not as full attention. And oftentimes there's no intention. So things are just kind of happening and there really isn't a strong awareness of what's happening. And then obviously there won't be um, a helpful intention if we're not really fully aware of what is is there for attention. So mindfulness practices, to step back a bit and say if we were actually practicing mindfulness in a formal way, 
we use the body scan. The body scan is where we go through the body. We feel the sensations in the body uh, without judging them. So we feel the sensations in our toes, in our feet, and we just feel them and just become interested in them. In formal practice too, we also do gentle movement. Gentle movement helps to make us more aware of our body, helps to bring us back into presence. And then we use mindful meditation. And mindful meditation now, in place of watching the body and not judging it, we're watching the thoughts and emotions that are coming up and we don't judge those. So that's considered mindful meditation, just observing without judging. And informal practices would be, in simple terms, interest. Uh, if we're interested in something, mindfulness is there. It interest is there before we have added our own commentary to it, our own thoughts. So that's the openness of, of interest. And so informal practice, we can just be interested. Um, grounding and opening, which we'll be doing a little bit of today, uh, just learning how to feel more grounded, more present in our body, and reflecting and letting go. So just, you know, we notice something, maybe we're driving and a driver has cut us off, so we notice that we're getting anxious or angry and we reflect on it, well, is that gonna really be helpful? He's already gone or she's already gone. Oh, okay, well, I'll just let that go. So those would be informal practices of mindfulness and these would be formal practices of mindfulness. Mindfulness also includes in the formal practice, it includes mindful attitudes. And so we have non-judging, patience, beginner's mind, trust, non-striving, acceptance, and letting go. And you can see that these seven mindfulness attitudes, uh, they're, they're pointing towards this um, learning, just becoming aware, um, aware before we judge it, uh, being patient with what's happening. Having a beginner's mind as if we just had this experience for the first time. Trusting, trusting in our own inner wisdom that we'll be able to work with this. Non-striving, not trying to get something. This is, I'm going to get this and I'm going to really uh, ace that. Acceptance. Ah, acceptance of what's here. It's already here. So, I have a choice. I can resist it or I can accept it. It's already here. And then the letting go. The letting go tends to be the, the most challenging thing for the mind uh, and research in the brain indicates that this is the most challenging thing for the brain to do. So again, this is the mindfulness triangle, attention, intention, and reflection. And so now we will look at an application of this. So we'll say that there's stress loops that have developed in the mind and there's been a thought that's come up. It's generated an emotion uh, ten minutes later, those thoughts are still coming up. The emotion is starting to generate more thoughts. And we can see that the emotion is getting stronger. And then maybe an hour of this, we can see that there have been many, many, many thoughts. And they're producing stronger and stronger emotions. So this becomes just a, a very draining, difficult cycle of, um, of the process that can happen in the mind. And that's saying that if there's a lack of intention. Now, if we did have an intention to ground, then what we have is we have an opportunity to direct our attention into the posture of the body. Now, when we do that, we become aware of the posture. Those sensations are in the present moment. So it's not something that's happened in the past, not something that's going to happen in the future. And what that does is that starts to rebalance the parasympathetic nervous system and allows us to come back into presence and it weakens those stress loops that we have had going on for maybe an hour or two hours. And this does take time. This would take up 10 to, 10 to 20 minutes of doing this because it takes that long for the parasympathetic nervous system to rebalance. Being present, ha. Ah. Uh, so that would be a phrase of, of intention, a phrase of intention, may I be grounded. So when we're feeling that, you know, the emotions are coming up, we're overthinking, then we can just set that gentle intention, may I be grounded. And so we put our attention then on feeling the sensations of the posture in the spine 
and feeling the sensations of the weight on each foot. So we can just feel those sensations. Those are grounding. And again, what those will do, they will rebalance the nervous system for us. So intention, this is where intention comes really uh, important whenever we're in the workplace and we're looking at connection. So it's so important to recognize that everything that we say and do is preceded by thoughts and intentions. Sometimes it's best to speak up, other times it's best to listen. Talking and listening are two distinct functions that affect the conversation list differently. How we talk and how we listen really have a big influence on the conversation.